So welcome everyone to the Radiation Safety in the Workplace webinar. Once again, my name is Tara Hargraves. I'm the Manager of Training at the Radiation Safety Institute of Canada. And I will do my best with this webinar format. As I mentioned, I'm much more familiar with training people in person and I do like to see the faces of the people that I am uh, interacting with. But Hopefully, we'll manage to have a great and informative session this afternoon. So the webinar is meant to run about an hour, and uh, we don't have a hard deadline here. So however long it takes, we'll uh, keep going. But we'll try and keep it within the hour. I know you've scheduled off that time. So what we're looking at covering today is uh, going over some different sources of radiation in the workplace and things that you may not have thought about in terms of radiation sources but are there. We'll look at the different types of radiation, what they're used for, where they're found, the health effects of exposure to the different types of radiation, and ways to minimize your exposure to those types of radiation. So I do have another poll to go over with you. And I was wondering from you, to the best of your knowledge, do you currently work around or with radiation sources? So a lot of answers coming in here. Give it just another minute. Okay, so let's take a look at what we've got here in terms of results on this poll. And this one I, I like. So the vast majority of people, 85%, are saying, yes, you know that you work with or around radiation sources. And that's not surprising, um, as I'm guessing quite a few of you have taken some training from us previously. And then we've got some people who don't work around radiation sources. So I'm glad to have you here. And a few people who admitted they're not really sure. And I, I'm glad we've got those answers there, too, because I'm sure that you're going to, even those who work with radiation sources or those who say they don't are going to discover that maybe that's uh, their sources they're not aware of and they're going to learn something about that. So that's wonderful. So when we think about radiation and where we might find it, one of the things that often comes to mind is nuclear power as a, as that place where radiation is most often used. And for those 85% who say, well, I work around or with radiation, I know that not all of you are at nuclear power, most of you are in healthcare, so you're aware that this is not where the majority of people who work with radiation are. So it's not just in nuclear power. We do find that radiation is used everywhere. So if you can think of an industry, I can probably tell you a way that that industry uses radiation sources. And that's particularly true when we start thinking about radiation sources as not just being nuclear sources of radiation or ionizing sources of radiation like nuclear and x-ray, but when we broaden the scope of what radiation is to its actual definition and then we'll get into all those different sources of radiation. So the different industries that use radiation, I've listed some here, but this isn't going to be a complete list because, like I said, if you can think of the industry, I can think of a way that that industry uses some source of radiation. It just might not be the type of radiation that we're used to thinking of. So every industry has its use for radiation, therefore every industry should be involved in learning about radiation safety. So we do find radiation everywhere, and that's why it's so important to know about radiation, the hazards, and how to stay safe. So here are some sources of radiation in the workplace. And what I'm guessing most people were thinking when we mentioned having a radiation in the workplace webinar is 
the X-ray sources or the nuclear sources, the ionizing radiation that we're so often thinking about in terms of hazards of radiation. We find those sources in so many industries from quality control to um, measurements for industry that are producing things, manufacturing things. We've got uh, sources, nuclear and x-ray sources used in medicine, obviously for diagnosis, for treatment. So those are wide-ranging and ones that are talked about often. But what's left off, less often thought about in terms of radiation sources are the non-ionizing radiation sources. So things that are coming out more and more for radiation use, lasers. More uses for lasers are uh, getting into industry. So laser printers and their players that we have at home for DVDs and CDs laser pointers, so every time you're doing a presentation and you pull out that laser pointer, um, scanners when you go to the grocery store, to other retailers, scanning those codes to put your items in, and then when we get into aesthetics, hair removal, there's also laser use for medical procedure like scar uh, removal, um, laser eye surgeries, so lasers are being used more and more and more throughout different industries. And then another source, and this is the source where you really can't get away from it, is the EMF, the electromagnetic fields. And within this group of sources we're thinking cell signals, radio communications, uh, if we're around any power lines, and, and in electronic uh, devices. So when the question came up here about what about sources, perhaps in commercial property management? Great question, and when we look at that kind of thing, when we look at those sources, where we were probably focused on is in the EMF. Uh, there's a lot of cell phone towers going up on property, on buildings, and those concerns come across from workers that might be in the buildings if they're commercial, if they're residential buildings, then we've got concerns from the residents within the buildings. And the other thing when you're uh, constructing the buildings, what we're going to see with nuclear sources is that we might find naturally occurring radioactive materials that are within the soil and uh, depending where it is that may or may not be a concern. So the radiation sources are very wide ranging. So just a few more questions here um, in terms of our polling. Just before we get into all of these sources, I'm wondering how much do you think you know about radiation? Okay, so we'll take a look at the responses here. I think this is great. We've got a few people who are confident to say that they're experts in radiation, which is wonderful. And then a lot of people who are pretty comfortable with the topic. And a few people don't know much at all or just know a little bit. And that's great. And that's we're glad to have you here and, and hopefully we'll uh, teach you a few things. And then I'm curious as to your opinions of radiation. So finish this sentence. I think radiation is terrifying, maybe a bit scary. It's okay, and it's great if it's used well. Okay, so we'll take a look at the results here. 
So most people, 71%, think it's great if it's used well, and that's a good thing to hear. And I imagine that a lot of people who are connected with us and who've decided to come take this ty type of training, you know a bit about radiation, and so you know that it's got good uses, and we just need to use it well. And we've got a number of people who've admitted to it being a bit scary, and that's perfectly fine because things that do have a hazard are a bit scary. And so we'll go through that and hopefully demystify some of the things about radiation for you. So that's wonderful. And just one more question out to you is, what radiation sources are you most concerned about? So going into this presentation, I'm curious as to what you as the audience are focused on in terms of your radiation concerns. Okay, so we'll just take a look at that. I'm sorry if you didn't get a chance to put your answer in there, but this is a, a great range. So the majority of people are focused on nuclear and x-ray as their main sources of radiation that you're concerned about. And then a few people focused on the EMF, the laser, the norm, and quite a few of you, some or all of the above, so a combination of sources that you may have in the workplace or that you may be concerned about personally. So we will touch on each of these things through this presentation and hopefully if there are more topics you're interested in, we'll be able to put those into a future webinar for you. So our big question is what is radiation? And this is where we're able to broaden our base away from just the nuclear sources and the x-ray sources, those ionizing sources. Because radiation is energy coming from a source. And so that does include all of our non-ionizing sources as well, the electromagnetic fields, the lasers. So radiation is energy the energy interacts with matter and how it interacts depends on how much energy it actually has. So I am glad we have some people interested in the non-ionizing radiation sources because we do want to touch on those today. So non-ionizing radiation, we're referring here to low energy radiation. This is radiation that does not have enough energy to break any bonds in matter. So when this radiation interacts with an object, interacts with a person's body, it does not have enough energy to cause uh, damage in the form of breaking bonds with getting into the molecules and breaking them apart. So it's a lower energy radiation and in some ways it's a bit more challenging to see what it does exactly. So a lot of this type of radiation are things that we are familiar with in our day-to-day -day lives. Radio waves, microwaves, this is our communications, infrared radiation, which is our heat radiation, and visible light. This is all stuff that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. And this non-ionizing radiation includes and is part of electromagnetic fields. So this is all electromagnetic radiation. And when we refer to electromagnetic fields, we're usually focused on things like uh, the radiation produced by power lines, electrical equipment, and radio communications. So electromagnetic fields do have potential hazards, but this may not be what you're expecting me to look at. So the main hazard when we encounter concerns about electromagnetic fields in the workplace is ensuring that the EMF 
levels are not high enough to interfere with medical devices. So for example, a pacemaker that somebody may have could be interfered with if that person enters an area where the electromagnetic field level is above a certain point. And there are guidelines on what that level should be and mainly you want to check with the manufacturer of that device whether or not the levels of EMF would be a problem. So that's our main workplace concern. Now when you do have workers who have to work on or around very close proximity to radio towers, to cell phone towers, there's potential for heating effects. So when you get high levels of non-ionizing radiation, you can produce quite a bit of heat there, and that could pose a hazard to the worker. The media likes to focus on potential of cancer risk from exposure to electromagnetic fields. But to date, in terms of what scientific studies have been done, and there have been plenty, there is no proven link to cancer or an increased risk of cancer from electromagnetic fields. Now I know that in, in terms of IARC, the uh, UN's arm that looks at cancer risk, that electromagnetic fields have been put on as a possible carcinogen. Now they have a list which ranges from not a carcinogen, possible carcinogen, probable carcinogen, and a carcinogen. Ionizing radiation does increase risk of cancer. EMF, so electromagnetic fields, they are put onto the possible list, but to gauge that risk, the other things on that list are pickled vegetables, coffee. So these are things that uh, we're not terrible, totally sure about, but uh, I don't know. And the other thing to keep in mind with those types of lists is that they talk about the risk, that there is a risk, but not the magnitude of the risk and how much of a dose you need. So the amount of dose is very important when gauging the actual risk. So those are key things to keep in mind. But as far as electromagnetic fields are concerned, there is no proven link to cancer risk at this point in time. Now people have concerns about EMF and an assortment of uh, problems like headaches, sleeplessness, um, I think there's a long list that people have come up with and through all the studies looking at these effects there is no link from electromagnetic fields to those particular symptoms. So it's not to say that the people don't have the symptoms but it is not the electromagnetic fields that are the cause of them. Now electromagnetic fields are regulated because there are heating effects uh, as were mentioned and there are effects with uh, electronic medical devices. So when we look at the regulation, the Health Canada has a safety code, safety code number six, particular for radio frequencies. So this would cover the radiation from cell phones, from um, commu mobile communications, but this does not cover power line frequencies. It does not cover the electromagnetic fields from electronic equipment. So with regards to mobile communications, Industry Canada um, looks after measuring the radiation fields uh, from cell phone towers and if there are RF sources within workplaces, then if your province does regulate for that, which they may or may not, the, that's a provincial regulation there. But in terms of the extremely low frequency electromagnetic fields, and we're looking at power lines and things caused by electronic equipment, there's generally no regulation for that exposure because we're not aware of any hazard. Now there's, that's for the exposure. There's of course, with any electronic equipment, and power lines, there is an electrocution hazard, and that's most certainly regulated. But in terms of exposure for the electromagnetic fields, 
there is no regulation for this. There are international guidelines for exposure to extremely low frequencies. And when we offer advice on these ELF, EMF exposures, we go to the international guidelines. Another form of non-ionizing radiation that is being used more and more and more in the workplace are lasers. Um, so laser scanners that we see in retail, laser pointers, uh, lasers used in research, lasers are used in medicine, and lasers are used in aesthetics. There are hazards associated with lasers, and they are very dependent on the particular wavelength of the laser and the power or strength of that laser as well. So laser hazards can range from essentially having no hazard. So the laser is at a low enough strength or power in which it cannot cause any damage at all. There are lasers that have the potential to cause damage, but if you allow for your natural blinking reflex, your eye will know when that potential is there and you'll blink often enough or frequent enough that you cut off the exposure to your eye and no damage occurs. Now with some lasers, there's certainly the potential for eye damage and we're looking there at the laser interacting with different parts of the eye, uh, potentially the lens or the retina, and causing um, perhaps blindness. And then when you get higher powered lasers, you get to the point where there's enough heat that if that laser encounters the skin, you could end up with skin burns. And in some cases, a uh, laser can produce enough heat that if it comes in contact with, say, um, a pressurized canister, um, other uh, chemical compounds, or electrical sources, that you have the potential for fires or explosions. So there is definitely a need for laser safety in the workplace. So again, not some lasers don't actually pose a hazard, so we wouldn't have to worry about putting together a laser safety program. There are plenty of laser devices that are engineered so that exposure is not there. If we can enclose a laser in a casing where that laser light does not come outside, no one will be exposed to it, then there is not a hazard as long as we don't override the safety features. With other lasers where that laser does encounter other surfaces in the area and has the potential to be aimed at a person, there are some key things to do in terms of laser safety. And part of that is to ensure to remove all reflective surfaces from the area to make sure to cover windows, to remove jewelry, to consider the paint on the walls. So to us, the paint might look matte, but to a laser, the wall surface might actually be reflective. So those are things that definitely need to be considered. Any fire hazards that are in the area should be removed, and the correct protective eyewear should be used. So there are safety glasses. You have to ensure that they are for the wavelength of the laser that's being used, then you want them to be of the appropriate optical density for the power of the laser so that if somebody is exposed to it, it will take time so that they are not affected by the laser. So it's important to have the correct eyewear. There have been plenty of cases where protective eyewear is available for laser use, but it's not the appropriate eyewear for the particular laser, which makes it not useful in terms of radiation safety. With regards to regulation of lasers, if we're looking at the manufacture and distribution of devices, uh, laser devices, they are regulated by Health Canada. So the manufacture and distribution, not the use. Um, so import of devices for sale um, 
and uh, sale of the devices, advertising of the devices. And that comes under Health Canada's Radiation Emitting Devices Act and the associated regulation. Any workplace safety with regard to laser regulation is under the jurisdiction of provincial governments. In some cases, there is not a specific regulation about laser. They aren't mentioned specifically, but they do fall under a general workplace hazard scenario under occupational health and safety regulations. A lot of workplace or provincial governments, sorry, uh, they tend to follow the ANSI standards when it comes to laser safety. So we are leaving here, if we will, the non-ionizing side of things. And I just wanted to ask a couple of questions here. Just for our own knowledge, with regards to EMF, are you interested in a webinar that focuses on EMF? Uh, we have had quite a few concerns about EMF and uh, people asking a lot of questions there. And we're wondering what kind of topics people might find useful. So we want to make sure that we give all the information and certainly we haven't covered the EMF hazards in as much detail as would be necessary for allaying fears at your workplaces. So we do want to ensure that we make that information available if it is uh, needed or wanted. So we'll just take a look at that and it looks like quite a few people are in fact interested in EMF related uh, concerns and some people maybe de guess depends on the topic so we are looking at future webinars and potentially having one that focuses on EMF and the concerns that people have surrounding that so if you're on our mailing list and you get informed of our webinars you'll know about that when that happens and then a follow-up question there is would you like more information on laser safety and we're just wondering how much of a demand is out there for laser safety. Uh, we know lasers are becoming more and more predominant in the workplace and uh, so thinking that people might have quite a few concerns there and we could potentially offer solutions for you. So we do have quite a few people that are interested in laser safety. Um, if you do want some follow-up there, we do have a free online course for laser safety. The focus was on laser hair removal, but the background information on lasers is quite general. So you might find that there's some good information there for you and that's somewhere where you can get started. So head over to our website to find that free online laser safety course. So online learning, dot radiation safety dot ca and we may be offering more laser safety training in the future so if you are on our mailing list you'll uh, end up hearing about that so now we're getting on to the main concern for many people which is the ionizing radiation and so for those who may not be familiar ionizing radiation this is our high energy radiation this is radiation that can interact with the atoms that make up our bodies. So everything in our world is made up of atoms, including our bodies. And when this radiation comes in contact, it has so much energy that it's able to knock uh, particles out of those atoms, so knock an electron out of orbit. On the surface, it may seem like, well, why is that very important? But when the atoms are connected into molecules and those molecules are needed for our body to stay healthy, then it can be of crucial importance. So the ability for radiation to knock electrons out of orbit is what gives it that ability to cause quite a bit of harm to us. And in fact, um, that's our main concern. So we'll see what types of harm in a moment. But let's take a look at the different types of ionizing radiation. So we've got our alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. These are three sources of radiation that come from radioactive atoms, most often naturally occurring sources of radiation. 
Within the atoms as well, we can have neutrons ejected. So those are a form of ionizing radiation. The tendency for us to encounter neutron radiation is in situations where it's purposely set up. So a nuclear power plant is a huge source of neutron radiation. Uh, we also find neutron radiation in something like a nuclear gauge uh, that has a mixture of americium and beryllium. So neutron radiation, we don't tend to see it uh, naturally occurring, it's there a little bit, but we tend to see it in our workplaces where we've specifically set it up so that it will be emitted. And then along with the gamma, we've grouped in there x-ray radiation, same hazard, same protection principles as gamma, but different source of radiation. So those are our types of ionizing radiation, our alpha, beta, gamma, our x-ray, and our neutron. And all these forms of radiation have a known potentials for harm. When we look at the different types of radiation, we can see that they have the ability to penetrate things differently. So our alpha radiation can't get through paper, can't get through a dead layer of skin that's on your body. Not an external hazard, but if you get it inside your body, then it's a problem. Our beta radiation can get through the paper. It's easily stopped by light shielding like aluminum or plastic or glass. It's mainly a hazard to us in terms of affecting our skin or eyes. And then we've got gamma or x-ray radiation, which can easily get through pretty much any materials. Lead is used as our shielding. It's our, our best shielding effort. But even then, we still have some of that radiation leaking through. So it's always present in our environment where there's that source. And that's why we want to be aware of the sources and ensure that we stay as safe as possible. So where does this ionizing radiation come from? Well, we can get it from, as I've mentioned, radioactive atom. And we can also create devices like x-ray equipment, which will uh, be our source of radiation. The wonderful thing about radiation devices, man-made devices like x-ray equipment, is that it's got an on-off switch. We don't have an on-off switch for radioactive atoms, uh, so as long as they're present, the radiation is present. But where we've got things like x-ray equipment, we can turn them off and eliminate the radiation from our environment. So some examples of radiation sources. We've got this fixed nuclear gauge. So this is an example of a fixed nuclear gauge. And I'll just grab my pointer here. So the source of radiation, if you can follow my laser pointer here, is in this side of the gauge. And most of this container is actually lead shielding. And the source of the radiation would be quite a small source just in the center um, towards this end of the uh, enclosure. Then on this side of this pipe, so there's a pipe here, is a detector. And so what we might be measuring is a flow rate, a density of the fluid through the pipe. So there are different things that could be measured here. This is a portable nuclear gauge. So there are plenty of these. I think about half of the licenses for nuclear sources out there are for nuclear gauges. Portable gauges are quite a few of those. Any place you've got sort of a construction work site, you'll probably end up seeing those at some point. Um, they're used to measure the compaction of the soil and the moisture of the soil. They're bright yellow, so you can end up seeing them if you're passing by a construction site. I know riding my bike through Toronto past a park, um, they were doing some construction on that, and I went by one day and saw the bright yellow telltale sign of a nuclear gauge, and I held myself back. I resisted the temptation to pull over, stop, and start asking them questions about their radiation safety program. I bet it would have caught them completely off guard that a passerby knows so much about their nuclear gauges but I decided not to scare them and didn't uh, ask them about their sources. But you will see them often at construction sites. 
We have radiation sources used in so many different places where people are often not even aware of them. So construction and manufacturing, I know those of you who know that they're there, you're responsible for them. Of course, you know they're used there, but I guess it, I would guess if you asked many people, they would have no idea that a nuclear source is used in construction or used uh, in a manufacturing plant. They're used in the pharmaceutical industry as well, so there are radioisotopes that are used as pharmaceuticals, they are used for testers, veterinary care, so there's not a lot of veterinary clinics that use um, nuclear sources of radiation, though they most, if not all, have x-ray equipment. And then we see x-ray and medical and dental and nuclear sources there as well. So there's so many places where we have nuclear sources of radiation being used. And even if you don't have the sources of radiation there on a regular basis, there are so many contractors that will use the sources. So in a building, if we're looking at the integrity, structural integrity of the building, a contractor may be coming into that building who will use either an x-ray or nuclear source to image the walls of the building and the structural materials. Uh, same goes with bridges and other large structures. We also have sources of radiation and there were quite a few people concerned about NORM, so environmental radiation. Um, when we look at enclosed and confined spaces anywhere, particularly if those spaces are below ground, you can have accumulation of radon or thoron gases. These are radioactive. The dusts present as well can be a radiation hazard. It's a potential there. So it's not always going to be a problem in all of these enclosed spaces, but it's certainly a possibility and something that should be tested for. If we go to the opposite end, so from underground to above ground, when we look at airline travel, uh, the crew that works on the flights who are there uh, all the time, that's their job, and our frequent flyers are exposed to higher levels of cosmic radiation, which is an ionizing radiation form, and that has to be monitored. So for airline crew, it's important to keep a log or track of the amount of radiation they might be receiving. And for anyone that works outdoors, radiation from the sun. So UV radiation, we've got ionizing forms of UV radiation, and just being outdoors increases your cosmic radiation exposure as well. So these are definitely things to be aware of. And then wherever construction may be occurring, digging may be occurring, industry could be moving around natural uh, radioactive material from soil and getting it to a point where it starts concentrating above the natural levels and now we've got a radiation hazard on our hands. So this can happen in agriculture, mining, the oil and gas industry. So this is something that people should uh, stay aware of. And certainly let us know if you're interested in a NORM webinar as well. I'm sorry, I didn't already put a question on, but feel free to leave that in uh, the comments or uh, sending an email out to us afterwards saying, hey, please put on a webinar about NORM. So we've also got our x-ray machines that are used in a variety of places. We see a dental x-ray machine there and the types of equipment are always changing. So from the dentist, you used to have just your regular x-rays and now you've got your dental panoramic x-rays and now you've got your dental CT scans. So we're always increasing as we figure new things out, our use of radiation, which means a ne necessity for having more and more radiation safety awareness and training. And we've got our baggage x-ray systems, cabinet x-ray systems, so anytime you go through the airport, your bags are scanned. There's a worker who needs to know something about radiation safety. And with cabinet systems, you use so many places for uh, checking things like circuit boards to make sure that welds on the circuit boards are connected, uh, connecting the different uh, components on there, um, looking at 
Sometimes we've got those x-ray systems on a manufacturer line. Food production uses a type of cabinet x-ray system to ensure quality control of either the food product itself, for example, making sure boneless chicken actually doesn't have any bones in it, or x-raying packages to make sure that uh, during the packaging procedure that nothing foreign got into the package like pieces of plastic or metal. So they are used quite a bit in quality control. So really why do we care so much about all this use of ionizing radiation? Well we've mentioned there's a health risk out there so we want to ensure that the benefits we get from the use of radiation outweigh the risk to a worker's health, to the public's health. So that's the main thing. There are so many things in the world that have a health risk associated with them and the key thing is to understand the benefits. The issue that we have with radiation is that it's something we cannot see, it's something we cannot touch, it's a difficult concept for people to understand and so communicating to workers, to the public about um, radiation sources and the hazards and putting them at ease is of crucial importance. So often people are afraid of radiation because they don't really understand it and that it has so many benefits to us. So for the, those who may not be familiar, when we look at radiation and from this point forward when I'm talking about radiation I'm really focused on ionizing radiation and that's what we tend to do as radiation safety people is oftentimes ignore the non-ionizing and by default when we talk about radiation as a term we focus on ionizing so I've done that here. So our ionizing radiation dose is how we're measuring our level of exposure to the radiation and that's in terms of looking at how much energy did the radiation transfer to us? How does it transfer energy to us? It transfers energy to us by knocking electrons out of orbit. So that radiation dose is measured in something called a millisievert. And you'll just have to bear with me. Um, if you want more information on dose measurement and you don't get enough in this presentation, we can certainly get into that after the webinar. Uh, you can certainly give me a call or send me an email. So when we look at the hazards from x-ray or nuclear sources, it's dependent on the size of our exposure to the radiation and the way that that radiation hits our body, which is a purely chance sort of thing. But it's entirely possible that radiation doesn't cause any damage at all that it goes through our body, that it doesn't interact with anything, that it causes no problem. It's very likely that the radiation can cause damage, but that that damage is repaired by our body. So it's not lasting, it's not a problem. And then we get into the point where, oh, okay, that radiation can cause harm in terms of causing cell death. And while that sounds very dramatic, cells are dying in our body all the time, did you feel it? It happened. It just happened. A cell in your body just died. Did you get that? No, because it doesn't cause any harm. So it's the level of cell death that depends whether or not we've got harm. That's why that box there is green on the top saying no problem, down to red at the bottom where we can have huge issues. And then we have our big one which is our incorrectly repaired damage. So we have damage to the body and that's incorrectly repaired by the body and so it's a lingering lasting problem that might be in there and we're going to see some of the effects. So when our eye is exposed to the ionizing radiation, the potential there is to develop cataracts and this could be because of low levels of radiation over a long period of time and that's why it's so important if you're working around x-ray sources that can cause the dose to the eye to have protective eyewear or to try and lower the dose to the eye and also to ensure when you're outside in the sun high UV days get those UV protective sunglasses on I know I argue with my son all the time saying put your hat on put your sunglasses on because I know even though he's five he's not gonna get the cataracts now but if he doesn't start protecting his eyes now when he's in his 60s, 
that's when he's going to develop the cataracts. And if he wore the sunglasses, he may not develop those cataracts till his 70s or his 80s. So it's so important to have that protective eyewear. If we look at the cell damage to the point where it kills cells off, if that happens in the skin and we get enough cells dying off, uh, we can have an effect where it looks like a burn. So it's burns in quotes because the effect looks like a burn. It's the same kind of uh, skin damage, but it's, you know, it's, it's hard to deal with. It could require skin grafts. It depends on the area that's affected. So that's one thing we want to make sure of. And where do we have that as a hazard? Not very many places not very many places if you're following proper procedures. Uh, but it is a potential if you get into an x-ray beam, you put your arm in there, that is a potential hazard. When we have a really high doses of radiation, which we should be able to avoid in the workplace, we have the potential for this acute radiation syndrome. And what is that? That's um, what we think of in terms of having the nausea, the vomiting, diarrhea, hair loss. So where we tend to see that, we tend to see that in people who are receiving radiation treatments for cancer as the side effects of that. And any exposure to radiation, no matter how big or how little, has a potential of increasing our cancer risk. So the low doses of radiation over long periods of time that we tend to have at a workplace our main effects that we want to try and avoid is our cataract damage and our increased cancer risk. So those are the things that we want to mitigate or try to avoid. So radiation, we know that ionizing radiation increases the likelihood someone will develop cancer. The more exposure, the more chance of developing the cancer. But there's never a level where we guarantee the effect will occur. So it's always just a risk um, that it could occur, similar to smoking. So there's no level of cigarette smoking that will guarantee lung cancer, but uh, smoking more gives you a higher risk. So not everyone who smokes packs and packs of cigarettes a day will develop lung cancer, but you certainly will find more in the, that group of people. Uh, just like with higher radiation exposures, you'll find more cancers than with people who have lower radiation exposures. But when we look at the level of radiation exposure that we generally find in the workplace, the risk is quite low. So we have this approximated risk of 4% per 1,000 millisieverts. For those who aren't aware, 1,000 millisieverts is your lifetime occupational radiation, ionizing radiation limit. And on an annual basis, we look at ionizing radiation being limited to 20 millisieverts per year. So we're looking at that in terms of a regulation, regulated level. And in order to get to that full 1,000 millisieverts, a person would have to get the maximum allowable level of radiation every year for, f for 50 years. And the likelihood of that ever occurring is slim to none. So the regulator would certainly be concerned there. And then at that point, if you ever got to that point, now you've got your extra 4% chance of developing cancer. But the difficulty with keeping this kind of risk in mind is that everyone is exposed to radiation. Whether you have a specific occupational source or not, we're exposed to radiation environmentally. So in Canada here, cosmic radiation is 0.3 millisievert radiation dose. Radiation sources in the ground, 0.35 millisievert dose. Um, internal radiation sources from everything that's not radon related is about 0.3 millisievert. And then radon, that's about half our background radiation dose at one millisievert. So we're already getting a fair bit of radiation from background radiation sources. If we look at the annual doses from this background radiation, in Canada we're around two millisievert per year. The United States on average is a little bit higher at 3 millisievert per year. The worldwide average is around that 2.4 millisievert per year. But there are certain places in the world that have a much higher background level of radiation. So if we go to northern Iran, uh, depending on what's going on with the radon in the soil, you can get up to 260 millisievert per year. So this is quite high. Um, 
and still we don't necessarily see those increased levels of cancer um, in the population because it's incredibly difficult to measure that when the background level of cancer in society is about 25% of people. But still, if we can avoid high radiation exposures, we should. And our external radiation exposures, so the sources outside the body, we can minimize those exposures by spending less time around the sources, increasing our distance from the sources just a little bit, and putting shielding between us and the source of radiation. And I do apologize, I am aware that we're getting to our one hour limit and I've just got a little bit more to go here so hopefully you're not at a tight deadline. So with radiation protection we also want to make sure to have good work habits so if we wash our hands, if we don't eat or drink in work areas, if we don't smoke in work areas, if there are the chance of getting internal sources of radiation uh, from dusts on our hands um, then we'll avoid that so we want to make sure to do what we can. So we need to follow our safety procedures at the workplace. Make sure you're aware of radiation sources that are at the workplace and have the appropriate training for those sources. And where there's protective equipment provided like gloves, goggles, clothing, that should be worn and used. And if dosimeters are available to monitor worker radiation doses, the worker should be wearing those for sure. So the nuclear source regulation, um, if it's any radioactive or nuclear sources, if it's nuclear energy, it's under federal jurisdiction. The regulator here in Canada is the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. And for X-ray and norm regulation, it can be a little bit more complicated. It's generally regulated by the provincial governments, and usually we're looking at a ministry or department of labor, whoever is responsible for occupational health and safety. But in special cases, it's the federal government that's interested. So when we're talking about uranium, which is naturally occurring, when that's being mined because of its use in nuclear power, that is under the jurisdiction of the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. When we look at importing or manufacturing X-ray equipment, then we look at Health Canada and the Radiation Emitting Devices Act and regulation. And the use of X-ray sources at federal workplaces is under federal jurisdiction so Health Canada provides the guidance on regulating the x-ray equipment and the regulator themselves is Employment and Social Development Canada who is responsible for workplace safety in federal um, workplaces. So just some resources for you as you go on to learn more about radiation safety, please do visit our website, radiationsafety.ca. You can also find some great answers on radiation-related questions at radiationanswers.org, which is run by the Health Physics Society in the United States. You'll find the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission at nuclearsafety.gc.ca, and they've got plenty of background information on radiation safety. And uh, the World Health Organization has some great information about electromagnetic fields. Uh, organizations, keep in, us in mind, Radiation Safety Institute of Canada, Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, Health Canada's got some great resources out there. Then we've got the International Commission on Radiological Protection and the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiological Protection. So thank you all for listening. I'm, I done my usual thing of talking a lot so anyone's taken training with me knows that I can talk a storm up. Um, this is just some information. Do feel free to give us a call at any time with any further inquiries or send us an email as well. And if you've got time to hang out and ask or listen to responses to questions, please feel free to do so. I will take a look and see if there are any questions out there and I will do my best to answer them. So just give me a moment to take a look at this. But thank you all for, for joining the webinar. And if you do have to leave, I appreciate your attendance. And hopefully we'll see you uh, another time. So I've got a question here um, saying that laser is not an ionizing agent. However, it could cause eye damage. Will the lasers of a certain frequency affect uh, to eyes of a fetus if and only if the eyes were half open. 
Uh, so if if the laser could get to uh, the eyes of the fetus in the womb, um, the penetration of the laser tends not to be that deep. Uh, so even when we look at damaging the eye of the user of the laser, the part of the eye that will get damaged is entirely dependent on the uh, wavelength of the laser. So it could be the lens or it may, if it can't get through to the retina, but it's not very penetrating. So I would say, and I have to admit that this is not my uh, complete expertise, but I would say that it's a very interesting question, but that the laser is not going to penetrate far enough into the womb. It won't get into the womb, so there would not be a hazard to a fetus in that case. But that's a great question. Okay, so another question that uh, in a particular slide indicated that all exposures can lead to cancer risk. What is the likelihood that exposure on the skin could lead to cancer elsewhere in the body? And so with that regard, and that's a great question, the place that is exposed to the radiation is the place that's at risk for the cancer development. So if it is just the skin being exposed to the radiation, then what we would be looking at there is an increase risk of skin cancer and it could depend on the type of skin cancer we could have something that's easily treatable or we could have something that's not at all easily treatable but again it, the part of the body that gets the radiation exposure is the part of the body that gets the increased cancer risk so just the skin exposed then just the skin is going to have the increased cancer risk Oh, and another great question, when talking about increase of 4% risk with every 1,000 millisieverts, is that 4% on top of 25% natural risk, so that would be 29%, or is it 4% of 25%, which is 1% making the increase uh, risk 26%? So that's a <laughs> wonderful question. So it's the 4% per 1,000 millisieverts of additional occupational exposure. So our baseline risk would be at the 25%. So then you're quite right with the first assumption there that that 4% would be on top of the 25% natural risk. So if you get the full 1,000 millisieverts, you get a 4% additional risk, giving your full cancer risk 29%. I do want to put a caveat to that and extra explanation in that that 4% is based on a lot of very conservative assumptions and is not actually something that we tend to see. So even when looking at cancer risks from uh, quite large exposures for things like um, nuclear bomb explosions in Japan or Chernobyl, we don't tend to see long-term higher risk of, of cancers. And then another question here, with a 20 millisievert max occupational dose per year, is there a dose rate per hour that we should not exceed at one time that we should avoid? Um, no, uh, there, it really depends on how you parse that dose out. So if you got a 20 millisievert exposure in a very short period of time, that's not enough of a radiation dose to cause any sort of immediate hazard like a skin burn. Um, we only start to see a hint of radiation exposure with a short-term dose when that dose is around 250 millisieverts. We wouldn't start to see any sort of real effects until we get to 500 millisieverts or above, and even then we're quite minor. So with the 20 millisievert max, there's no dose rate to avoid. If we stay below that 20 millisieverts, that's not a problem. However, in terms of procedures, if you had a 20 millisievert per hour dose rate and someone got their full uh, annual dose in an hour, 
that's going to be a regulatory issue because I'm guessing a procedure hasn't been set up quite right. Um, so another question come up, won't it give a radiation burn with 20 millisievert in an hour? No. Um, so if you had a 20 millisievert per hour dose rate and you stayed there for a few hours, certainly you could. But if you cap that dose at 20 millisieverts and you end it there, then there would not be a radiation burn. So the dose to the skin in particular in order to get the skin effects has to be in around the, uh, and I'm going to switch dose, um, doses on you a little bit, but it has to be in around the 3000 millisievert to the skin. Um, and that's a bit different than say a whole body dose and I know I might be getting a little bit more complicated than I should at this point but I'd be certainly happy to continue the discussion if more clarification is needed but it takes quite a high threshold to get to a radiation burn to the skin so a 20 millisievert dose in an hour would not lead to a radiation burn So I'll give you a moment if anyone wants to type in any further questions. That's all the questions that had been put out there. I do hope that everyone found this to be a very useful webinar. And I just want to let you know that I will be returning um, on August 9th to provide another webinar. Uh, it will be called Foundation of a Radiation Safety Program. And I will be covering uh, putting together a radiation safety program for nuclear sources of radiation and basing it on the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission's license application. So if you are interested in that topic, please do join me on August 9th. Okay, so another question did uh, pop in here. Uh, asks, if exposed six hours daily to high-definition LED TV, will it affect my eyes? And, you know, I would have to look into where you might have eye strain with TV. Now, certainly it does not have the ability to cause damage in the way that a laser would cause damage to the eyes. Um, I have to say that I haven't looked into... Uh, how a TV might affect vision, but my gut tells me that you would be totally fine to continue binge watching on Netflix, which I know I like to do when I can get the ability to do it. Um, so I would suspect that no, it's not got the same sort of power level that a laser uh, would have in terms of being able to cause the eye damage. So if there are no further questions, it's been wonderful having you all here. I do apologize for going a little bit over time, but I think we got some great things discussed. So again, please do join me on August 9th, and you will get information about the recording of this webinar for the future. Uh, thank you all for joining me, and have a wonderful day.